Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for this educational Innovise webinar. My name is Rajan Sanhotra, and I'm part of the marketing team here in the Innovise UK office. This webinar forms part of a series of webinars focusing on microdrainage. While this session will provide very much an introduction to the system, the next, taking place on the 11th of December, will, fo will focus on how to gain approval on microdrainage designs. Details of this webinar will be sent to all in the upcoming week. For those of you who may not be familiar with Innovise, we have a long history of empowering water professionals around the world to create, manage and maintain water services. We are the global leader in water infrastructure data analytics software, providing an enduring platform for customer success. Our intention is to make sure that in your work you can design, model, review and manage with confidence. This also means that we strive to provide excellent customer service and support and that we offer continuing educational opportunities like these for engineers and others in our industry. Innovise offers a library of software programs for water, sewer and storm modeling, stormwater and drainage design, which will of course we'll be expanding on today. I would like to add that this webinar uh, has been supported by our partner Sustrain, so thank you very much for that. Now, on with our presentation, I would like to introduce our presenter. Today's presenter is Max Anderson, who I'm sure some of you are familiar with. After finishing his MA at Durham University, Max it joined Innovise where he's the product manager responsible for microdrainage. Max is an advocate for the latest industry thinking, particularly in relation to sustainable urban drainage systems, aka SUDS. Max is a wealth of knowledge when it comes to today's topic, microdrainage. Thank, thank you again for joining us today. Max, take it away. Thanks very much, Raj. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Brilliant to see so many people joining us uh, for what today is going to be uh, a stripped back, right back to fundamentals introduction to microdrainage. Um, so what we'll do um, to, for the scope of this is I'll give a little bit of a background to microdrainage. I appreciate some members of the audience may well not have heard uh, the name microdrainage before uh, and, and what the software is and, and what it aims to achieve. Uh, we'll then step forwards into uh, a bit of an overview of some of the fundamentals of drainage design. Um, so we'll look at some of the common problems around drainage design and what it is that as uh, engineers we're looking to, to achieve um, and the problems that we need to solve before we then go forwards and start looking at how we can use software and a microdrainage package uh, to enable us to do that. And we're going we're gonna to take a detailed look at three different tasks uh, involved in the use of software. Optimizing uh, and designing a pipe network, designing a pond, uh, a storage structure in conjunction with some flow controls, and then finally testing a completed design um, to the point where we can then approve that design and generate some useful outputs to take forward to the next stage of the, of the life cycle of our, of our project, so in and uh, moving forward towards construction. Uh, we'll also talk about some, some further resources uh, and also for those of you um, that haven't experienced some of our, our training, um, we've got some great training courses as well that cover um, a lot of the, the information you know, it, that we're going to cover briefly in this webinar today in a lot more expanded detail um, for you. So we'll give you some details about training courses and where you can come and see us at some of uh, some upcoming events uh, as well. So I'll move on now to our first poll question, uh, which is just to get a bit of a flavour of, uh, of the audience that we've got today. How would you describe your current level of understanding of microdrainage? Um, so hopefully you can all see a poll now uh, that's been launched, so please uh, go and, ha and select that, have a look. Um, we've got four options up there, uh, and we'll see those votes coming in and just have a look and see where we as a collective audience are sort of sitting uh, today. We'll just give that another sort of 15 seconds or so, so get your responses in uh, whilst you can. And now we're going to close the poll, and we'll share those results with you now. So, yeah, really interesting. Um, that we've got the, the largest number of you out there um, have no previous experience of microdrainage. That's absolutely fine. This is a, a, an introduction uh, webinar, so we were, we were sort of expecting that. Uh, and then again, we've got a couple of people who, who've used it on, on a few projects um, out there and a couple of the experts in there just coming to, to, to have a look and, and see what we're teaching in regards to the fundamentals. So brilliant stuff. Um, so for those of you that don't know and aren't familiar with microdrainage, uh, microdrainage has really developed to become the de facto industry standard drainage design software package within the UK. Uh, and some of the key reasons uh, why we, we've grown um, to this sort of position uh, and, and microdrainage is 
such a well-known name, you'll see it on job specs and, uh, and role, um, requirements for a knowledge of microdrainage, or previously Windows, um, which was the old name of, of microdrainage when it was back when it was first launched in 1983. So we've been in this market for, for a long period of time, and as a result, the software has grown up alongside uh, the needs of drainage design engineers and approving authorities as the use of technology um, has been uh, incorporated into uh, design methodologies within engineering practices. Um, we also uh, do a lot of work to, to help um, shape the industry as well, so uh, we fantastic opportunity we were engaged as a partner of the SOSTRAIN, which is the UK's leading community uh, in regards to sustainable uh, drainage uh, and some of the thoughts and best practice uh, going on around that, uh, and we'll talk more about, about the SOSTRAIN and, and some of the resources that are there for you later on. Uh, but microdrainage is not purely a UK and, and Republic of Ireland applicable package. We do have an international mode as well. Uh, and it's been fantastic to see uh, microdrainage being used on projects all around the world, and that's reflected in today's audience as well. So brilliant to see so many people joining uh, from across the globe. Uh, fundamentally, microdrainage is all about the optimised design of storm and foul water networks. So we need to be able to design these, utilising latest hydrology, um, so theories and methodologies in there, uh, and then being able to analyse and go through the approval process of that design to make sure that our design has met a series of design criteria. The other thing that makes microdrainage so popular is that it's a modular system. So you can add different bits of functionality to suit your needs. Um, most recently, we've, we've developed an integrated capability to Autodesk Civil 3D. Uh, so that's a very popular CAD package uh, within the industry being able to use our microdrainage design to create intelligent, data-rich and data-smart objects with inside that environment. We'll take a sneak peek at some of that uh, later on. But what's microdrainage used for? Well, it's used on a whole host of different projects where we need to be able to, to conduct some sort of drainage design. So be that foul networks, um, where we're dealing with foul flows, relatively uh, predictable flows, uh, and also then um, stormwater as well. So when we're looking at drainage of hard standings, hard surfaces, uh, we're increasing impermeable areas often when, we, when we're doing our design, we need to be able to mitigate against the, the effect that that has and that will generate more runoff, more rainfall uh, needing to get to water courses. So we have to design stormwater networks to be able to convey, clean and treat those flows before they, they, they discharge into uh, uh, to receiving water courses. Uh, we're also uh, heavily involved in highways uh, design. Highways design has come to its own set of standards around drainage design as well. Um, uh, and also uh, some of the national level infrastructure projects that I'm sure many of you are very aware of. Um, microdrainage was used as a drainage design package um, on a, a number of these projects. So um, next time uh, you visit the Olympic Park or you're going on one of the motorways and you're seeing those roadworks up and down, uh, the country, chances are if some drainage is going in, it's been designed in microdrainage um, and it's being put onto the ground. So when we look at the modular system of microdrainage, we have a whole host of different modules that we can utilize within uh, the drainage design package. Um, so just to give you a brief overview of these, we have a suite of sort of eight of them that all work together um, and tie together to form our, our network. That's the, the main package um, for designing um, drainage networks, uh, being able to analyze those networks, look at things like overland flow route identification, which is becoming a really important part now in, in some of the design and approval processes, um, as well as being able to integrate into things such as um, the CAD environment, which we, we saw earlier on with our module called Drawnet. We've then got a series of standalone little pieces of, pro, uh, of programs, such as the source control module, that we'll be looking at later on today to help us design individual storage structures uh, and, and substructures um, as we sort of move through. Uh, that will become a lot clearer and a lot more obvious as we go into the use of the software. However, we're going to start by just stripping it right back and looking at some of the aims and principles of drainage design. 
So when we have a site that we're considering doing our development on, the first thing that we need to, to start to understand is the current hydrology and behavior of water on that site. Now, it could be that we've got a greenfield site where there's no previous development going on already, and there are, high, uh, there are, there are methodologies out there for being able to describe um, the, the response of that site to a particular rainfall event. And my training utilizes some of these to enable you as a user to get a, an eyes on, sort of first handle on, on what the site is, is likely uh, to do. Uh, but then also we need to understand how any changes that we make, so when we're developing increasing impermeable area, what effect that is going to have on that hydrology and how we're going to mitigate against some of those changes uh, as well. That then leads us on to designing a system uh, to convey um, that discharge to a suitable point of outfall. Now, that point of outfall could be just infiltration into our soil. It could be a, a water course, a small water course, or it could be, uh, in the worst case scenario, uh, an existing uh, main sewer uh, that we need to uh, connect to. Uh, certainly, in the, in the case of a fan system, uh, that's what we would, uh, we would come across. Um, and the, the aim of this is to ensure a minimum level of service is provided by our drainage design system so that we can have confidence uh, to a, a level of probability that our system will be able to cope with um, an appropriate amount of, uh, of water coming into it. And then we've also got some of the uh, construction standards that we need to to be aware of as well. So we need to be aware of these construction standards, so the physical siting and location of drainage elements. We're going to need to consider the position of those and whether we've pursuitively protected and designed those correctly as well. There's also going to be a huge driver in terms of cost-effective design um, as well. So microdrainage has tools built into it to help us analyze the costs um, and, and do some optioneering around different designs uh, as well, so that you make sure that we're delivering um, value for money without compromising on that hydraulic performance and we're still achieving what we need to. And finally, once we've got to that stage where we're happy and confident in our design, we're going to be producing a whole host of different outputs and records to enable construction and auditing, maintenance, and, and then the future asset management of, of that network. Um, as we move forward. So again, microdrainage is geared up to be able to pass all of this information, which back in the good old days of sort of paper printouts and records, it would probably be stuck in a folder and that would be moved around. No, we're moving towards uh, BIM, so this better information modeling, and being able to keep hold of all of that virtual and, and, and data and moving it forwards in the life cycle of the project as well. So, we have a whole host of different design standards that, they, that will be required to, to sort of lay out some of those aims. Um, so uh, one, one that's in, in place within England uh, is the sewers for adoption uh, standards. So these outline and define the construction standards um, and design standards to which our, our stormwater networks um, that are adoptable, so adoptable by the water companies, need to be designed to. And we have whole hosts of different rules. So we have rules about layout and access, rules about the reliability of the system, so in terms of making sure that we have a velocity which will help cleanse those pipes. And then finally as well, we have hydraulic design criteria as well. So this really is often, um, often, often the one that becomes most apparent to design engineers when they're going through. This is things like making sure we don't have flooding on the site to a given level or expectation of severity of storm. Now, these storms, uh, it's very difficult for, for weather forecasters to be able to tell us precisely when it's going to rain. It's even more difficult to tell us exactly how much it's going to rain. So we do take a probabilistic and statistical approach to defining rainfall. And um, we'll talk more about rainfall and how we use that uh, in a second. So when it comes to assessing hydraulic design, we need to bear in mind that we've got to come up with some level of design rainfall events, so some, some best estimate of, of rainfall that the site is likely to encounter in order to be able to, to prove that our network appropriately deals with the rainfall that is predicted. Overall, a good way to think about this is that we need to try and mimic our natural hydrological processes 
this is also a, 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 and also maybe providing betterment where possible. So if we've already got a, a, a previously developed site, we need to be able to, to provide betterment. Um, and this gives way to our four pillars um, of SUDS design, really. So for those of you uh, who, who maybe aren't familiar with SUDS, Sustainable Urban Drainage Systems, this is really a big direction that we're, we're focusing towards uh, as an industry. Um, so not only do we need to assess the quantity of water, so that no flooding sort of requirement, but we also need to start thinking wider than that, also towards water quality. So we need to start thinking um, about uh, reducing pollutants that are likely to, to be in that flow. Similarly, providing amenity, so public amenity, open space, better places for us to live, and also biodiversity as well, so better places for nature to exist in. Uh, and that's also something that, with the use of software, we can start to assess and analyze how well we, we start to meet and balance off all of these criteria as well. First of all, though, um, for those of you who, who may well have been involved in drainage design a little bit in the, in the past before, uh, which of these criteria do you find the most challenging in your typical drainage design uh, work? So again, just give us your answers. We'll see what this looks like in the poll. So really interesting to see that the, these, these answers are chopping and changing about a little bit, actually. So we'll give it 10 more seconds, and then we'll close the poll and publish it, and we'll, we'll have a look at what we've got. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, so hitting a discharge rate, yeah, there is a, 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 as number one, yeah, quite a common, uh, a, a common problem. So when we're looking to mimic, uh, mimic um, and replicate our natural processes, we don't want to be discharging water faster than water is already getting into um, to water courses. And that often means that we have to put things in the way to slow down the flow. Um, so limiting discharge rate, yeah, very much, I would say, in my own experience, that's, uh, that's often, uh, often the one that causes the most headaches. And then, again, Interesting to see that water quality treatment is now yet yeah, starting to cause a, a, a few problems. That's good that it's featuring in your in your thinking um, as well. So that's interesting, and we'll see how microdrainage can can start to help address those problems as we go through. So thank you for that one. So drainage networks. Then, if you've not seen a drainage network before, let's have a look at, at sort of two different approaches um, to developing a drainage network. We need to be able to drain water from a, a large area of land across our site, okay? And one of the typical or more traditional ways of doing this has been to try and get the water into a conveyance system, so pipes, really, or conduits, to move that water away from the locations where it's originally falling and, and take it towards our point of outfall. Uh, however, pipes are really efficient ways of moving water so water tends to, to move very, very quickly and all come and coalesce together uh, at one single point, uh, which means that in order to hit that discharge limitation that so many of you have been finding sort of a, a big problem, we normally have to stick a very big sort of flow control in the way. And because we're going from some water arriving quite quickly to only being allowing, allowing it out into the water course quite slowly, that puts in place a large requirement to have some sort of volume in which that water can back up uh, and only be allowed out at a smaller, uh, smaller rate of discharge. So traditional networks, they tend to potentially have fewer pieces of storage defined, but those storage volumes are often very, very large um, with significant control restrictions. And this will allow us to, to increase the expense. And also, as that water is moving through the pipes, the water quality isn't really being improved very much whatsoever. However, um, we've got an alternative way of doing that, which is using SUDs, so sustainable urban drainage systems. And what we can actually do, if you look at this, uh, this one down here, is you can start to, 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 to reduce the need for, for, for large pieces of storage by actually treating the water at source, so much closer to where that water falls, looking to benefit from things like such as infiltration, 
natural um, swales and things that will encourage biodiversity and immunity. And all of this will help slow that flow down so that actually by the time we get to the point where we're discharging, if we do have any water um, that needs to positively discharge off our site into something like a receiving water course, the discharge control measures that we need to put in place are often much smaller. And as a result of having balanced the system out uh, in a much better sort of approach, um, we can actually reduce um, the, the amount of storage required and therefore mitigate against high expenses. And also, uh, we can see water quality improvement uh, as well as we get sort of natural uh, processes acting on, on water being filtered through some of these structures. So just in case you haven't heard these, uh, the, this term of SUDS before, this is sort of quite a nice little demonstration of, of what we can achieve sort of in, in terms of SUDS. Some key terms then as we get going into the software proper. Um, you'll hear me talk about uh, cover levels. So when we're looking at a cover level, um, we're looking essentially at a level from our design surface, our ground point. Um, we tend to refer to it as a ground level when it's not in the location of a manhole. When we're at the location of a manhole or a junction, these typically have covers, manhole covers, and therefore we're talking about cover level. Similarly, you'll also hear me talk about cover depth across a pipe. So that depth from the surface down to the top of the pipe or the top internal dimension of the pipe. And that is known as the pipe socket as well. Bottom of the pipe, so that bottom of the internal of the pipe, known as the invert level as well. If we have a situation where we have a pipe coming into a manhole a little bit higher um, than an outgoing pipe, but we may have something called a backdrop. So you can see there's a separation here in the invert levels that's creating uh, what's known as a backdrop within our system. Backdrops may or may not be allowed depending on our design criteria, and we can get microdrainage to set up certain rules about having or not having backdrops present within our system. The biggest problem, or perhaps the, the most immediate problem, is going to be understanding how much rainfall, in the case of a stormwater network, we're needing to design for in, in, in the process of uh, designing for our pipes. So we have within our standards, such as the sewage reduction uh, uh, guidance oh, standard and also the design manual for roads and bridges, methodologies for being able to, to describe um, a, a severity of rainfall event that we need to be able to cope with. That severity is often referred to as the return period um, of the rainfall event, and that comes down to sort of an annual probability of the expectation of reoccurrence of the particular rainfall event. So you'll hear us talk about the one in one year storm. So the worst storm that on average would have a, a, a reoccurrence every year, therefore an annual probability of 1% of being exceeded in any given year, all the way up to say the 100 year or even 200 year um, storm events. So they have a, an annual probability therefore of, um, uh, of uh, 0 0.005, um, sorry, maybe one extra naught on there, uh, percent um, of being uh, exceeded in any given year. So this is where the probability sort of comes into to it. But thankfully in the, in the UK, we're very well served by different rainfall theories. So you might have heard of the flood studies report rainfall data or the flood um, estimation handbook rainfall data series that allow us to do that. But the important thing to note is, is that these rainfall theories, they are um, statistical uh, in their nature. However, they are based on some observed data. But fundamentally, that rainfall is going to vary in different parts of the country. So wherever your site is, you need to consider the design rainfall for your site. We have variation between whether we're looking at summer and winter, and we need to consider both of these effects when we're doing uh, our, our network uh, design and analysis. Um, and we also have different peak in this as well. So you might hear peak intensity. So in the middle of a rainfall event, design storms are shaped as such that they, they will hit their peak intensity right in the middle of the event. So if we've got a one hour long storm, 30 minutes into that, we're going to see the peak rainfall intensity falling, both in summer and winter. When we're using design rainfall as well, the duration matters as well. So because of this, um, we need to test a whole range of durations. So 
shorter storms, they tend to have much higher peak intensities, but it doesn't last very long. So there isn't all that much volume. However, you can have sudden little periods of inundation, flash flooding sort of effects. So that could cause critical failures within our system. Similarly, with longer storms, where you've got greater volumes of water, but less variation uh, in the intensity um, or the peak intensities uh, of these events, um, it tends to be just a sort of a slow water rising up around your ankles scenario uh, where we, we, we're seeing a, just a, a lack of capacity in the network. But when I look at a network, there's no way for me to immediately be able to see which of these failure mechanisms is going to be the most critical. So as a result, when we're doing our analysis of, of stormwater networks, we have to assess all of these different durations as we go through. We'll see that uh, in a second in the software. We're going to start with our first problem then, which is designing a pipe network. So our pipes need to be sized based on the amount of flow that they're required to deal with. Okay? We've looked at designing rainfalls and rainfall theories, so that allows us to be able to generate a flow that a pipe may be required to deal with. So here in the UK, we use a modified rational method equation. So Q, our flow, is equal to 2.78 times CV and CR. CV and CR are volumetric uh, and, uh, runoff coefficients and routing runoff coefficients. They're dimensionless, so the important ones to focus on are the next two terms, the intensity and the area. So for a given area subject to a particular intensity of rainfall, we will generate a flow. Once we've got this flow, this runoff, we can then look at sizing that pipe and we can do the sizing of the pipe through a whole host of different equations so you've got cobalt white equations or mines equations so what we're looking at here is we're describing this flow against things like slope cross-sectional area of the conduit that we've got to be able to, to push this uh, or, or transmit this flow through and the velocity that that flow may well be moving at so here we've got mines equations for circular pipes and SI units so if anybody wants a bit of fun, you can try and rearrange this equation to solve for um, D, because D here is, is the diameter of a perfectly circular pipe um, that we're now going to move on to having a look at a, a typical uh, problem. The way that we have to set this up within microdrainage is we set up a whole host of different design criteria. So the first bit will describe the rainfall. The second box down here um, to the bottom left is describing how we change that rainfall into runoff. And then finally, we've got some design standards. These relate back to things like layout, size, um, safety, whether we are going to allow some backdrops or not within our system. But this is the problem that we're going to consider to begin with. So imagine we've got to transmit a flow of 500 litres per second. And we need to do this using a pipe that's going to be laid as a 1 in 100 gradient. But we need to determine the diameter of concrete pipe. Well, this is quite a simple problem for us to solve by hand. So if we did do that rearranging, and, and kudos to anybody that was, was able to rearrange the equation, uh, then what you'd be able to see is if we put all of the appropriate values into this, we'd see that the appropriate diameter to transmit this flow be approximately a 543 millimeter point. That's a bit of an odd size. So in the case of, uh, of, of standard um, sort of industry sizing, we'd be looking at a 600 mil pipe. So just to show you how we can do this in microdrainage, I'm going to put in the same information into microdrainage, and we should hopefully see microdrainage picking the same size of pipe. So the first thing that I'm going to do is oh, go back. We'll just start microdrainage, and I've got my network module selector switched on. And this is the system one brain. So this is the pipe design brain of microdrainage that I'm now going to use. And the first thing that I need to do is just enter in some design criteria. So we're going to be looking at the one year rainfall event. However, you, you'll see that we've had um, 500 liters per second, which is actually going to act as a base flow. So whilst I'm putting this information in, this is all necessary if I'm using areas. Um, and we'll come on to, to those in a bit. But at the minute, we're, we're OK. So I'm just going to say OK to my design criteria at this point and try and replicate that problem that we've just seen. So 
the first thing that I need to do is tell my credential which pipe this is going to be. This is going to be pipe number one. And if you uh, remember from earlier on, uh, we said that we were going to lay this pipe. We'll, we'll say it's 10 meters long, but we said that the slope was going to be 100, one in 100. So you can see that the fall has been calculated automatically. I'm going to ignore the area because I'm going to use a base flow instead and say that that base flow was coming in at 500 liters per second. And instead of pipe roughness, I was using the Manning's equation. So I can put on my Manning's N and tell it the roughness of this concrete pipe. So at this stage, I've given it all the information that I knew from my hand calculation. And if we click OK, what you'll see is microdrainage has done the design of that pipe automatically. And it says, Max, you need to use a 600 millimeter pipe. So you can see that we've got a 600 millimeter pipe. However, if we, we remember from the PowerPoint, it was 543 millimeters. So if I go back to my design criteria and tell it, we can use a pipe size of 545 instead of just 600. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to provide it a couple of pipe sizes either side so that you can see that it's not going to, to jump about. So hopefully we've got that four, uh, 545 pipe in there. If I click OK and jump back to my result, you'll see that now it knows that there's a better pipe for me to select rather than that 600 mil one. So it's chosen that 545 millimeter pipe. So I can now see that my drainage is doing exactly the same process that you would potentially be going through um, on your own sort of if you were doing a hand calculation, but the benefit is speed. So you'll see that I've just been able to do that for one individual pipe there. Okay, quite trivial, could probably do it by hand. However, imagine what happens as I start to add more and more pipes into my network. I might only know things such as the two points between which the pipe is going to run. So I might know the pipe length. I might not know the slope. I might only know the area that that pipe is going to drain. So the fewer bits of information that I know, the, the harder and harder it becomes to use hand calculations to be able to, to size these networks. So what you'll see I've got here is I've put in some information relating to a pipe network now and what micro drainage also allows me to do is have a look at the long sections so i can see from this one just based on the information that i sort of put in by hand i've actually i've, I've messed it up a bit because i've got pipes sticking out of the ground they're not in the right place it's not gone to plan i can see right down here i've got big problems so another massive advantage of micro drainage is that we can now optimize this design. So I've made a couple of mistakes in here. I haven't put the pipes in correctly. What I'm going to do is if I just show you, if I just put these two things side by side for each other, so my store network details and my if I tile these next to each other. What I can do is I can click the optimize button and this is saying to my drainage, go back, look at all the information that I've put in and actually size the pipes correctly. I've made a couple of mistakes in here. You go and, and size these pipes and position them such that I'm not doing things like this coming out of the ground and breaching minimum depths of cover because this might be a road and that road might expect, expect a heavy traffic load. And therefore, I need to put my pipe low enough into the ground that those, that loading isn't going to damage my pipe. So if I just click Optimize, what you'll see now is that in a single click of the button, my drainage has been able to go through and optimize all of these pipes. So it's now laid those perfectly um, in order to not breach minimum depth of cover, but also hit good velocities within some of the branch lines to my network, being able to achieve this straight off the bat. So again, I can see some of the pipe diameters have had to change as well. Um, but again, maybe you're really good. Maybe you're able to, to you're a super uh, sort of whiz at this and you can, you can do all of your designs straight away. But what happens when we get a, a, a revision to our design? So the revision here is, is going to be that pipe 1.001 needs to be moved out of the way for a gas main. And so we've cited that in the wrong location. Now, if you're doing this by hand, you're staring down the barrel of an awful lot of, 
uh, of rework and calculation. However, in microfinance, we can make the change really simply. So we can say, well, actually, I need to move this pipe down to 96.5. It needs to be the invert level um, to, to keep this pipe out of the way of that gas name. So I can use my auto design lock to say this one is red. This is user specified by me, micro drainage, I'm not allowed to play it with it. And you can see that the pipe has moved now out of the way. So if we go for another optimize, you can see how micro drainage has flattened out some of the downstream end of the pipe. So it's minimizing that cost of construction for me in terms of the depth. And it's trying to achieve the best velocities within the system that it can. We don't want the flow moving so fast that we're going to get problems with erosion but we need to have it moving fast enough, at least one meter per second, uh, to avoid um, any, uh, any um, sedimentation within our pipes. So you can see here, this is micro drainage, just very simply adding in a small design change and that change being replicated and optimized through as we go through sort of network design. So at this point, there is one other point that I'm, I'm gonna mention which is you'll see the pipe numbering down here. Now in micro drainage, pipe numbering is really, really important. We operate on something called the dendritic numbering system. So dendritic being tree-like or meaning tree-like. So if you imagine the branches of a tree, that's exactly the same in, in micro drainage. We have to define each pipe in turn from the most upstream pipe all the way to the outfall. And the way that we will do this is by adopting the numbering um, convention that follows as such. So the first pipe, the most upstream pipe, is always going to be pipe 1.000. If you look in the little diagram we've got here, we've got another downstream pipe, and all we're doing is we're just ticking over to the next value. So it's still a it's still a one pipe, still in branch one. Okay, but now we've got this interesting little node where we've got we've got some branch lines coming in. So we've got to go up to the top end of these branch lines and start defining these. So here I've picked branch two, but again I've got another pipe on here. So I've got branch three as well. So I have to then put in branch three, final branch of branch two, and then I've got to do four as well. If I just started going on to branch one again, then I'd be saying that branch four is actually coming in further downstream than it is. So I just have to step through and work out where these pipes are in order to give them the correct nomenclature so that micro drainage knows what's going on and which pipe comes into which location in the network. One of the things that we can't do with dendritic numbering is you can't split off in two different directions as you move downstream. That's known as a bifurcation uh, within a pipe network. Um, we can't do that in design. However, when it comes to simulation, we absolutely can. We can set that up as an offline loop. Um, so if you've got something like that and you need to create bifurcation in your microdrainage model, you're going to have to pick one of those directions as being your primary one and ignore the secondary, sort of the, the other half of the bifurcation um, until a bit later on. We'll come and put that in in the simulation instead. The next task that we're, we're going to move on to, so we've just seen the, the demonstration of optimizing pipe network, it is now designing a, a, a pond. So this could be a substructure, it doesn't have to be a pond, it could be a piece of perennial paving. Okay? But often when we're doing this, we need to consider the levels and therefore the volume as well that we've got available to us when we're designing this system. So to, you, to help us design an individual storage structure, I'm going to go uh, into the source control module of microdrainage. This is the most basic module of microdrainage that everybody out there who's got access to a copy of microdrainage you will have access to source control. So what I'm going to do in here to start off with is I'm going to use something called the quick storage estimate. And this gives me an ability to estimate the size of my structure roughly um, based on the return period, so the severity of the storms that we're looking at, um, the location in the country that we might be, and then also the impermeable area, so the total area that this pond is going to be collecting water from, given a discharge condition as well. So in this first case, I'm going to use a 30-year return period. This is typically the one for which we're allowed no flooding on the site. And I'm going to use the FSR. This is the older rainfall theory. But if I click the map button, 
what you'll see in here is that we can then just click on a location within the UK. I'm going to choose Oxford. And it automatically populates some of the rainfall data for me. So with the FSR, this is all built in. If you're using the other UK rainfall theory of FEH, you can pull the FEH data in as well. But that information is available through the FEH web service um, from uh, the CEH in the UK. If you're working internationally, you can pull in IDF data as well when the software is in international mode. Our impermeable area will we'll consider quite a large site, so we've got 26.9 hectares, and we're going to say, well, the maximum allowable discharge rate from this is going to be 270 litres per second. Notice that I've also got values for summer and winter. That's because we'll test summer and winter as well. We can also do things like calculate an infiltration coefficient, but we'll model for the worst case scenario that we haven't got the ability to lose water to infiltration, and we could also add climate change if we needed to normally seen as a 100-year event and upwards. We'll analyze this, and microdrainage is looking at all of the different profiles of those storms. And based on that um, discharge rate, so only ever being allowed to discharge a maximum of 270 litres per second, it's now given me an estimate here that I'm going to need to provide somewhere between around 6,500 um, metres cubed and 9,400 metres cubed of storage. So this is really useful because that can give me a good first guess that I might need to provide something, say, in the region of 7,500 metres cubed of storage. And we'll use that as a first guess, rough estimate figure, and see how well that, that comes off. Um, I can also see what happens if I were to, uh, to change this requirement. So if I was to make it more restrictive, well, then I need to provide more volume. And similarly, if I was allowed to slacken off my discharge requirement, then I could get away with less volume as well. So I've done that now. So uh, microdrainage knows, right, well, you've done a quick storage estimate. I'm guessing you haven't just done it for the fun of it. You're going to go on and try and design a piece of storage. So yes, that's what we're going to do. Now I'm going to pick a pond as being my storage structure. I also get to pick the different flow controls that I'm going to use to hit that 270 litres per second. Now, in this first case, I'm going to go with an orifice, and also um, I'm going to use an overflow of a weir. I don't need an overflow. It's just going to be a good trigger to make sure that I can understand uh, whether my network is performing correctly. It's already picked up all of the rainfall details that I had previously, so I've got those in place. And say OK to that. And what you can see here is that microdrainage has taken my area and it's breaking it up because it's saying, well, not all of that area is going to drain into the pond at the same time or in the same rate. So here it's just evenly broken that up. But what I could do if I wanted to is I can import a time area diagram and see a correct distribution instead. Um, these time area diagrams you can pull from your network details as well. So if I were to have a look here, I can go file and I could export a time area diagram. Uh, instead, you see save time area diagram and pull that into the design of a piece of storage. If I knew I had a pipe network working in conjunction with this storage. Instead here, I'm just going to accept these as they are for the minute. So I'll say OK. And now I get the, the form to, to start designing my, uh, my tank. Oh, which is just struggling a little bit here. Unfortunately, um, the joys of IT, my system is decided not to play ball um, at the minute and show you this. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to close this and instead I'll show you that again starting from scratch. So if I just pull up my module selector, start source control, we can quickly come up with another design uh, in there to see how that design is going to perform. So what I'm doing with a new, new job is we'll go through our tank or pond, say orifice, and you'll see when you become quite speed at this, hopefully we should be able to, to get through this in, in good order. And we'll say that this is, um, in fact, let's just say that it, we're going to go for about 26. So we'll say uh, 6.5, 6.5. 6.5 and 6.5, total of 26 hectares, okay, in here. Now, at this point in the tank pond storage structure, I need to consider the cover level, so the point at which my flooding would occur. 
Well, I drew a quick schematic and we can see this as being 102 meters, my top of embankment. I'm going to have 100 meters as being the bottom of my pond because any permanent water isn't available to us as a storage volume in response to a rainfall event because it's already going to be filled with water. And then finally, I'm going to say, well, I don't really want to have more than 1.5 meters deep in my 30-year event. So I can put a crest overflow in at 101.5 just to alert me to the fact if I'm going deeper than that. So say 102, invert level of 100. And now what I can do is I can say, well, I've got 1.5 meter depth to play with. So between these two depths, I can now use a little calculator to say, first of all, set a side slope volume. So I might uh, a side slope. So I might only be allowed a maximum side slope of say one in four. So I can apply that. And then again, what I can do is between the same two depths, so by highlighting the two depth areas, and then set a volume. And we said that about 7,500 was going to be our initial volume estimate. So there I've now put in correct amount of volume, maintaining the one in four meter side slope relationship as well. I can extend this out if I need to create some benching to get it looking like my model. And then up to the two, I could say, well, actually, we're going to extend out again a side slope relationship of one and four. So there's my pond. I can set my orifice. And again, I need to consider the design depth, which is 1.5 meters, and design flow of 270. So you can see I'm using a 334 millimeter orifice. And finally, for my overflow, I can say that the crest level of this will be 101.5. Um, and, and I might just make this very, very wide, because I don't really want any water going over it. Just going to check on that orifice, I forgot my invert level, so it will say 100 for that as well. So I've put that all in place. And if I click Go now, this is my drone starting to do its actual analysis of the system. And what you'll see is that in very, very quickly, it's run through all of the different storm events, from 15-minute summer storms all the way through to uh, 10,080 minutes, which is actually a week-long rainfall event. Um, and it's identified for me in red the critical storm. And if I have a look at this critical storm, I can see that the maximum depth of water in here was 1.486. So I've got a little bit of freeboard, a couple of sort of 14 mil of freeboard um, left in this event. And that's no surprise because actually I knew that that, that volume is, is, is going to behave correctly. We can also have a look at the animation of this. So you can see this, how it's responding against the time in the simulation. We can see how that water is going um, and filling that pond and how the inflow and the outflow are differing as well. So we record all of these. But most crucially, most of the time when we want to see something like this, we will be looking instead at the output hydrographs. So here, really nice and obvious, you can see the difference between our inflow from the rainfall event and our outflow being capped off there at 270 litres per second. Now, any graph like this, we can then put into a formal report within microdrainage. So we can go to print and create a report. Or alternatively, we can save it out as well. And we can save it out in, in a whole host of different formats. So that's designing a pond. Now what I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to look at all of this when it's been collated together. So that when we've got storage structures and we've got pipe networks working in conjunction with each other, we create a final design. And when we've created that final design, such as one that I've got here, we need to be able to test it and analyze it in response to a whole host of different criteria. So to do this, we can use the simulation criteria. So simulation criteria will set us up to run one individual storm event. So here, I've set up the model to run a 100-year, 30-minute winter storm in my analysis. However, we've just seen that we actually need to do a full sort of look at a whole host of different durations. So in order to look at those different durations, I'm not going to use the simulation criteria. I'm instead going to use some really helpful wizards. So these wizards, seasonal return period wizard, allows me to apply a whole host of different rainfall events against my model. So I can do this. So I'm going to run 
one year events, 30 year events and 100 year events and I'm going to run a whole host of different durations. So if I click on that and do the analysis, what you'll see is that rather than having to go through by hand and work out what's critical, microdose will actually allow me to identify critical behaviour automatically. So if I want to see the worst rainfall event in this network, just come over here and I'll click the critical storms button. And I can see in my network for the 100 year event, I've got some flooding. I've got some flooding at the top end of my network as well as the bottom end. And notice that the bottom end of the network is most critical against the 480 minute storm, but at the top end, it's that 50 minute very short sharp rainfall that's giving me the most problems. It's stopping the water getting into the network. So maybe I need to make some pipes a little bit larger to help transit that flow further down and into the network in that very short storm event. However, this is just looking at the hydraulic behavior um, of the network. We need to be able to analyze it against a whole host of other criteria as well. So if we want to go and have a look at those other criteria, then we can, we can use a design audit wizard. And we're going to do a lot more. Our next webinar in, in the 11th of December is going to focus heavily on how we audit these microdrainage designs. Um, but what you can see here is I can run tests against all the different things, such as manhole size, maximum length of pipe, cover levels, as well as then being able to put in the same criteria that we have here to run a whole host of different storms and checking for different requirements, like no flooding in the 30-year case. I can set that up and get microdrainage to look at it for me. I can also look at discharge tests as well. So if I needed to do a discharge test, I can tell it what the maximum flow rate it's allowed to discharge at my final pipe is for any given return period as well. So normally I would calculate these through a Greenfield Raft calculator. Here I'm just going to put them in as some, uh, some standard uh, values in here and say, right, okay, we'll do a quick test and we'll say the maximum volume uh, available. Let's put that up at 5,000 and just see what's what. Uh, normally I would calculate these, but for time, I'm just going to I'm just going to run with those and show you that microdrainage will flag any failures to these criteria for me automatically. So it's going through the same process running all of those different storms. And what I get here is I get a summary of my reports. So in here I can see the audits. I can see that I've passed everything other than um, uh, well I can see which tests I've passed and which ones I've failed. So I've failed on my cover levels. And I can go and I can have a look at that. I can see more information about exactly where I'm failing on that test. Similarly, if I go and have a look at the um, velocities, actually, yeah, here is where I'm failing. So I can see all of these results automatically. So if you're an approving authority out there, this is of key interest to you, the ability to quickly be able to size against a whole host of variable criteria and check to see whether the design is acceptable. Let's imagine that our design has managed to pass all of this. We now need to be able to export it. And we can do that in a whole host of different ways. So if I'm printing my data, I can set up my own customizable report. So I can look at my scheduling. I can include my critical results. I might also want to include information about the, the, um, any online controls that I've got in here, and an area summary, and maybe some setting out information. I can update this and microdrainage will generate for me a nice formal report that I can then submit either in printing, printed format or as a PDF. Alternatively, if I wanted to as well, I can export any of my model. So I can export my model out in a data rich format through into, um, into CAD. But alternatively, just to show you, if I've been working in the CAD environment, so microdrainage will plug into CAD as well. So again, we had a great uh, webinar, our What's New 2018.1 demonstrated this as well. But I can work inside a civil 3D environment to define the network as well. And then, if we just take a quick look at this, what you'll see in here, if I've got some 3D orbit going on, is we actually end up with a data-rich 3D model as well within microtraining, uh, within civil 3D. But these elements are my microdrainage model. I can see in here and I can play with them, I can move and adjust. 
So that, folks, has been a bit of a whistle-stop tour into um, micro-drainage. Uh, one of the key things that I'd like to, to, to know, though, from, from you guys is which methods of output are most important to you when you're analysing or, or producing um, your designs. So uh, this has been something which we found has changed recently quite a bit. So we've got the formal reporting, uh, which tends to be obviously very key, but also we're now starting to move towards intelligent and data-rich models as well. So um, it'd be interesting to see where, for, for some of you who are, who are particularly new to microdrainage, where you feel um, uh, these outputs sort of, uh, sit. So we'll close that poll now and we'll have a quick look at the results. Actually, yeah, so it's quite a, quite a tie in, in regards to um, the formal reporting and the, the 3D data-rich models. This is something which microdrainage has been groundbreaking um, in its ability um, to be able to create these for you within Civil 3D. Um, so, so this has been, been something which is really interesting to see. Of course, the good old CAD line work, uh, line work as well, so our long sections, which often many of you are extracting from your data-rich models anyway. Um, interesting to see. Um, yeah, interesting that GIS-based uh, information is still a bit of a requirement from some of you uh, in there, but, uh, but yeah, it tends to be the, the way that GIS is a bit more modeling focused and at the design stages, um, we're, we're tending to be focused on our uh, on our integrated models, but thanks for that. Really interesting to, to see that. So again, all the different outputs that we can have within within microdrainage um, as well. So interesting to see that. Well, one, one other one that wasn't there in your options, but video playback as well. Um, one of perhaps the most useful features of microdrainage is where we have flooding. We can play. We can show someone. So if you've got you're trying to describe uh, do some community engagement why you're putting in a drainage scheme, you can show them the effect of one model where it's the house is being flooded and the other model where it's not. Um, so yeah, one of the best ways to, for public engagement as well is you've actually got this 3D video playback capability on software as well. So further resources then, um, we mentioned them earlier on, we are a partner of, uh, of SOSTRAIN. It's a wealth of information. Um, I would thoroughly recommend it to anybody to go and have a look there. If sustainable urban drainage is something that's completely new to you, that you haven't heard of before this webinar, please go and have a look, see some of the fantastic case studies and briefing notes that are up there um, that, that will sort of give you some guidance on, on how we can do that and, and, and the benefits that you can, you can have from them, as well as the SUDS manual, which is the go-to guidance document for the design of SUDS structures as well. I appreciate it's been quite a fast-paced webinar today. So the Innervise YouTube channel, I thoroughly recommend. If any of you have thought, oh, that was a bit quick, um, go and have a look on there. We've got a whole host of different um, webinars and recordings and information regarding microdrainage. So if this has whetted your appetite, please feel free to follow it up um, with that um, or get in touch and ask us any questions as well that you might have. Uh, training courses, just to highlight to your attention, uh, we'll be running uh, microdrainage two-day introductory courses on the 4th and 5th of December and also 15th and 16th of January, uh, as well as some more advanced micro change courses, 11th to 13th uh, as well, uh, details of which can be found on our website. Likewise, if you email education at innervise.com, we can provide you with, uh, with further details and, and prices of some of these. If you think that micro change uh, is it, something that you really want to, to get to grips with, there's no better way of, of doing it than attending our two-day instruction course. Um, upcoming events, um, if anybody's attending the Flood Management uh, Forum uh, in, in London tomorrow and on the 22nd, I will see you there, uh, fortunate enough to be, to be speaking on SUDS design uh, as well. We're also in Lyon uh, in France um, at the end of the month, uh, as well as World Water Tech in, in London next year as well that we're looking forward to. Um, but I would recommend and, and bring to your attention uh, our next webinar, um, the next webinar is going to be a slightly different format. It's, it's new for us, but we're going to run that as an interactive session where you will actually be doing some of the webinar, some of the auditing, and giving us some of the answers as we go through. So really excited about that one. It's going to be brilliant. That's the 11th of December, so details on our website. You'll also see some communications after this, so please feel free to dial into those. Just remains to say thank you ever so much for joining us today. Um, it's been a fantastic uh, 
webinar. Uh, we've had so many questions, apologies we haven't been able to get to them uh, so far. We will be publishing a Q&A sheet following this. Uh, great to see so many people involved uh, and look forward to hopefully uh, seeing you all shortly uh, or on our next webinar on the um, 11th for more micro drainage. Thanks ever so much. Thanks to Raj and the, the marketing team. No worries, no worries. And as I said before, uh, if you have any questions regarding micro drainage or any of the other related topics, please do not hesitate to get in touch at education at Thank you and have a great afternoon.